Ms. Kim is the head of office of uh, office of the United Nations Project Office on Governance, UNPOG, which is an integral part of the Division for Public Institution and Digital Government of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. She holds several senior position in the government of the Republic of Korea related to public administration and governance. And she also has an extensive international experience. She contributes to digital government, innovation and government, open government and public service innovation. Ms. Kim, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, Distinguished participants, um, resident coordinator, colleagues, on behalf of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, Division for Public Institutions and Digital Government, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual workshop on subsidiarity, one of the UN principles of effective governance for sustainable development, which were developed by the Committee of Experts on Public Administration. This virtual workshop will focus on strengthening subnational authorities for SDG implementation in the Africa region. I wish to extend our deepest appreciation to Ms. Nejad Jarok the moderator of today's session, for her support of this initiative. I would also like to recognize the speakers and authors of the strategic guidance notes on subsidiarity for their expertise and significant efforts to strengthen local government in Africa. This workshop is a follow-up to the one we had for the Asia Pacific region in December last year, which highlighted the issues of urban governance, fiscal federalism, and multi-level governance in the context of national perspectives in the region, including from Pakistan, the Philippines, and Mongolia. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the principles of subsidiarity, Central authorities should perform only those tasks which cannot be performed effectively at the more intermediate or local level. Acceleration of action on the SDGs will not be possible without localization. Local and subnational governments are best able to deliver essential public services such as food security, access to quality education, and health care, and act as catalysts for transformative change. Engaging subnational governments and local communities in the design, implementation, and monitoring of public policies creates inclusive and participatory implementation of the SDGs. To bring government to the people, at the local levels, countries, and their constituent subnational governments must work in new ways and with new partners using all the governance, fiscal, and managerial mechanisms at their disposal. This often involves strengthening public sector capabilities at subnational and local levels and taking steps to ensure their financial stability. Decentralization outcomes also depend on the quality of multi-level governance mechanisms in pursuit of whole of government and whole of society approaches to the challenges of sustainable development. Local governments around the world play a crucial role in delivery of the SDGs, but they face immense challenges, such as inability to raise sufficient funding 
lack of capacity, and weak multi-level governance systems and coordination mechanisms. The content of the five strategic guidance notes, which are being presented here today, show how local governments can most effectively finance their investment in the SDGs and critical services, such as clean water and sanitation, adequate and affordable housing, public health and disaster risk management. They also show the importance of efficient allocation and use of resources at local level, strengthening local institutions and planning capacity, building resilience through improved disaster risk reduction and effective coordination and cooperation across levels of government. Importantly, they also serve as a solid basis for targeted capacity building, which UNDESA, through your request to the PIDG and UNPOG, stands ready to support. Ladies and gentlemen, I trust you will find this virtual workshop on the principle of subsidiarity enlightening and that it helps you identify tangible steps that you can take to operationalize localization of the SDGs. I wish you a good workshop with productive discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Miss uh, Hee Young Kim, for uh, your inspiring speech. And I take from your uh, opening remarks that decentralization efficiency depends on the quality of multi levels governance system, namely coordination, coherence, and cooperation. Thank you very much for your support and for your trust. And now, I am inviting all the honorable speakers to activate their camera for a group photo. Please. Thank you. It's okay, Anna, for the picture? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. So now we will uh, move to the second segment of our agenda, namely the national uh, perspective. And we will have four honorable speakers. The first speaker for this workshop, which will be uh, highlighted by the intervention of 10 speakers who are joining us online. Let us uh, start then with the national perspective. And I have the honor to introduce you, our first speaker, Honorable Ms. Rebecca Ada Donto. Ms. Rebecca is, a peace, is the United Nations resident coordinator in Malawi, and she is a peace building and development practitioner with over with over 30 years of service in national public service, non-governmental organization, and the United Nations, focusing on fragile trans transitional and humanitarian contacts in several countries. So, Honorable Miss uh, Rebecca, please, the floor is yours. And uh, as uh, requested, uh, all the uh, speakers have about seven minutes for their speech. The floor is yours, Madam. Very much, and warm greetings from the um, beautiful and warm heart of Africa. And thank you very much for this opportunity to contribute to this important conversation. And um, subsidiarity and decentralization are the heart of the top level of sustainability and development. These are national ownership, sustainability, conservation. Also, call on us to. Before I go into the substance of my reflection, let me briefly introduce you to the home of where I am privileged to serve the UN President Coordinator. 
Malawi is home to the beautiful name Malawi, the third largest freshwater and second deepest lake in Africa, with an estimated population of 19.9 million in 2021. Malawi is one of the 10 most deadly populated countries in Africa. Malawi has shown resilience in the face of normal challenges. Its more interest in total transformation for tropical fine was recent, which was tropical corridor Friday in March 2023, which left a number of the same shipment eggs. Over the years, progress has been achieved in some exigies, such as exigies two, three, four, and six. The new self economic diversification and economic transformation, transforming the new life in the sequence and new set of future, makes the country vulnerable to increasing the war attention. Consequently, the country faces the persistent and high level of poverty. Excuse me, uh, Ms. Rebecca, excuse me to interrupt you. We are not hearing you very well. If you can uh, see what is uh, the issue, please. Okay, let me move the uh, my closer. Can you hear me now? No, no, still not very well. I'm sorry. Let me, okay, let's. I can use my computer. No, as... Now it's perfect. Is it good now? Perfect. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, thank you very much for drawing my attention. So, uh, over the years, progress has been achieved uh, in SDGs such as SDG 3, 2, 4, and 6. Uh, but limited economic diversification and economic transformation characterized by heavy reliance on subsistence and rain fed agriculture makes the country vulnerable to increasing and more intense shocks. Consequently, the country faces persistent and high levels of poverty, food insecurity, malnutrition, and widening income and gender inequalities. Politically, Malawi has remained steady, made steady progress with four political transitions and transfer of power. The country is currently undertaking macroeconomic reforms to address macroeconomic imbalances and to bring back the economy on a sustainable growth pathway. Anchoring all of these reforms on the principles of subsidiarity and decentralization could help accelerate achievement of the SDGs and Malawi's 2063. Reflecting on Malawi's subsidiarity and decentralization pathways, I would like to start by saying that Malawi's national development strategies have consistently identified decentralization as a key vehicle for strengthening local service delivery. Decentralized service delivery was formally enshrined in the 1994 constitution as part of Malawi's transition to multi-party democracy. Implementation was directed by the 1998 Local Government Act and the National Decentralization Policy. The Ministry of Local Government is the lead agency in coordination and implementation of the decentralization policy, and the National Local Government Finance Committee leads on fiscal governance in local authorities, while central sectoral ministries lead on policy formation and establishment of standards and monitoring. These delivery ambitions in turn have reflected in Malawi's medium to long-term development strategies, including in Malawi Vision 2063 and its 10-year implementation plan. It is important to note that Malawi's decentralization pathways should be analyzed with attention to their underlying political economy drivers and not solely analyzed from a technical perspective. In Malawi, decisions surrounding decentralization of funds are often the result of strong incentives for political leaders and central ministries to retain control of resources for capital expenditure while also retaining contribution for developing tangible development outcomes to citizens. This is notably illustrated by the two most devolved sectors, education and health which still sees central government continuing to manage capital investments and expenditure, including procurement and the distribution of materials and even some small scale public works. 
This is mirrored at the local level where those funds that are decentralized become victim to excessive um, fragmentation here and there. Although this does also allow for the cost and benefits of development spending to be spread out across many actors. These all contribute to an uneven implementation of decentralization while continuing to make public commitments to the principles of decentralization. The reality of decentralized service delivery in Malawi to date has been characterized by um, overlapping mandates and responsibilities, both between and within all levels of government. On paper, sector policies reflect elaborate norms and ambitious standards on equity, affordability, and access. These policies should be matched by expenditure allocations that support the functions for which local government is responsible and the corresponding budgets for service delivery and the degree of discretion that local governments have to make decisions on how to deliver services. In practice, however, decentralization reforms have been rolled out in an uneven and sometimes incomplete fashion. This is further complicated by the fact that many sectors are funded by and significantly dependent on development partner support provided off budget. The cumulative effect of these dynamics is a system of fiscal decentralization in which finance has not really followed function. Even though the principles of national decentralization policy have been consistently reiterated in most sector strategic plans since 1998, the share of local government expenditure has more than half as a percentage of total government spending over the past 17 years. In turn, this has reinforced and deepened the capacity constraints facing local government officials who are tasked with carrying their service delivery responsibilities in the face of an often unreliable system of fiscal decentralization. So for meaningful deepening of decentralization to con continue, the vicious cycle of low trust, low investment, low accountability in local governments needs to really be looked at again. Malawi's uh, decentralization journey is currently seems to have been stuck in a kind of a quagmire. Local government capacity constraints have historically served as a justification for retaining funds at the center or for significantly earmarking funds through conditional transfers, meaning in many instances, local governments are sometimes reduced to the role of implementing organs of the central government rather than governing agents in their own right. Despite these challenges, there have been several meaningful policy choices in favor of decentralization over the past few years that present great opportunities to incentivize the improved delivery of services to citizens. And some of these include the, the 2014 reintroduction of elected local councillors. We now have local councillors that are elected. The introduction of the District Development Fund for the first time in 2016, providing discretional development resources for councils to address local priorities. And then in 2017, there was the devolution of human resources. Um, Honorable um, Rebecca, can we yes. conclude, please? Yes, thank you. So quickly, UN is supporting Malawi in many ways. We are supporting them for data development, delivering as one at the set decentralized level. We are also supporting integration across ministries and departments at the national and decentralized level. We've planned for this year to support data management system and improve the local and urban development planning processes, oversight and delivery of services. So in conclusion, um, subsidiarity and decentralization, we know and say they both respect human dignity, which is important for sustainable development and peace, but they also promote inclusion. So if indeed one, uh, if indeed no one is to be left behind, the principles of subsidiarity and sustainability and decentralization should be all of our guiding lights for accelerating achievement of the SDGs. Um, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Ms. Rebecca Ada Donto, for uh, sharing with us the experience of uh, Malawi, who is in fact one of our members in UCLG Africa. And uh, she highlighted the fact 
Sorry. Can you uh, please? Thank you. She highlights the fact that decentralization is among the national vision and uh, strategy with the several institutional and legal arrangements, but still health and education are centralized in Malawi. Uh, decentralized de depends uh, on funding from partners and also the issues of capacities. And she concludes with the support uh, provided by UN uh, system. Thank you very much. And now I have the honor to uh, invite our second speaker. I am uh, honored to introduce uh, you, Mr. Dr. Bala Youssef Yunuza, who is the Senior Technical Advisor to the Office of the Senior Special Assistant to the President on uh, Sustainable Development uh, Goals. In, his, in this capacity, he provides technical leadership and strategic policy guidance in the overall implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in Nigeria. Besides so many other achievements in his uh, biography, he facilitated the adoption of the Millennium Villages model at the national level, reaching 21 million people across 113 local government areas. Bravo, Dr. Bala, and the floor is yours. Uh, merci. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, a very good afternoon from Abuja. I bring warm greetings from the Office of the Senior Special Assistant to the President on Sustainable Development Goals. And I appreciate the organizers of this strategic virtual meeting on subsidiarity and decentralization for sustainable development. Um, talking about uh, multi level governance. Uh, following the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in September 2015, Nigeria acted very quickly in operationalizing the global goals. And uh, Nigeria um, uh, has a huge implementation context for the 2030 Agenda, and of course the Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. Uh, we have a country of uh, 923,000 square meter, uh, kilometers divided into 36 states and the federal capital territory, 774 local governments. And therefore, our strategic approach to the implementation of the SDGs can be seen at two different levels, at the national and at the subnational level. Uh, at the national level, we work closely. I mean, the Office of the Senior Special Assistant to the President on SDGs was established in 2016 as part of the institutional framework to guarantee effective implementation of the SDGs. And the office has fourfold mandate, that of strategic planning. Hello? Yes, we are hearing you, Mr. Bala. That of strategic planning, coordination and guidance, that of representation, advocacy and partnership building, that of resource mobilization and management, and finally, monitoring evaluation and reporting for the SDGs. So at the horizontal level, at the national level, the office works closely with the ministries, departments, and agencies, if you like, to integrate and mainstream the relevant SDGs into the sectoral policies and plans of the ministries, departments, and agencies. And we do that by institutionalizing frameworks that will support uh, the implementation at the horizontal level. Now, talking about multi-level governance, the fiscal federalism, uh, empowered the 36 states and the local governments with 50% of the national resources. And therefore, power is naturally decentralized in Nigeria, and the 36 states are autonomous, and the 774 local governments are autonomous. Just like we have uh, the national office coordinating the implementation of the SDGs as part of the multi level governance for operationalizing the SDGs, all the 36 states have similar offices either the Office of the Executive Governor on SDGs or the Office of the Special Advisor or Senior Special Assistant to the Governor on Sustainable Development Goals. And what we do is to enable, throughout the multi-level governance structure, is to empower, enable, capacitate the 36 states' offices of the SDGs to, if like, mainstream, integrate, and develop SDG-based medium and long-term 
development plans based on the development priorities and aspirations of the states. As we speak to you today, we have about 18 states on demand-driven basis that are at different stages of the development of their SDG-based development plans. About seven of the states have completed either a 10-year, 15-year, uh, or 25-year uh, uh, long-term SDG-based development plan that mainstream the, the, the sustainable development goals into the plans of the states, uh, and by extension, that of the local governments. Um, so the vertical coordination approach is that this office from the national is strengthening and supporting the 36 states and the FCT SDG offices to integrate, if you like, and mainstream the SDGs into their sector, uh, into their medium and long-term development plans. So for us, our multi-level governance for the delivery of the SDGs has to follow our fiscal uh, federalism as resources are fully devolved to the sub-national level. As we speak to you today, when we conducted the, the first and the second voluntary national reviews, we conducted uh, uh, the reviews across the uh, the 36 states through the six geopolitical zones. Uh, we built capacity of the subnational governments on SDG and streaming uh, and integration, as well as uh, support you know their ambitions to uh, produce. Uh, voluntary local reviews. Uh, at the moment, we have just completed the, uh, the, the, the voluntary local reviews in two states in Nigeria, uh, Lagos State uh, in Southwest, as well as Kaduna State in the Northwest. And most states are beginning to uh, align with their uh, SDG-based development planning, uh, 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 are committed, uh, if you like, to conducting voluntary local reviews of the sustainable development goals. Um, uh, this, we believe, is uh, an appropriate institutional framework to support multi-level governance uh, in a way that uh, uh, concept of subsidiarity and decentralization uh, enables us to, to operationalize the sustainable development goals. Uh, these uh, offices, for example, the office at the national level, it's well capacitated with resources, uh, with the appropriate political commitment right in the office of the president to provide horizontal and vertical intergovernmental planning and coordination for the sustainable development goals. It is important to highlight, uh, like uh, uh, earlier I mentioned, um, the fiscal, I mean, the, the, the federal system will operate, enable this uh, multi level governance uh, structure or framework for the delivery of the sustainable development goals to happen. Uh, for the sake of time, I am seven minutes on the dot, and I would like to uh, stop and thank you very much uh, for, your, for the opportunity. I look forward to a productive discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bala, for sharing with us, I guess, a unique federal system in Africa, uh, highlighting the horizontal and vertical uh, perspective, uh, which give a sense to the federal uh, the fiscal decentralization in uh, Nigeria. And I also highlight the political commitment and uh, the appropriate means given to your office to, uh, uh, to meet your uh, mandate and uh, agenda. Uh, now, uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Bala. We will uh, have our uh, third speaker. Uh, let me introduce to you Mr. Uh, Tibogo Matlo. He's a project manager, international programs and partnership within South Africa Local Government Association, SALGA in South Africa. Let me just uh, share with you his uh, impressive biography. And he, by the way, he's one of my colleagues. SALGA is a member of UCLG Africa and a powerful one. So Professor Tibegu uh, has worked for SALGA for uh, 18 uh, years as an uh, analyst and also during uh, his uh, impressive career, he has won several awards at the best employee at uh, Mopani uh, FET College and Salga, including team of the year for making impact through building inclusive green municipality project. Current interest are uh, for him are sustainable development goals, asset management, environmental sustainability, lastly leadership, 
Power for Influence and Political in Project Management. Professor Tibego, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, my apology, I have uh, a flu. However, I will try by all means to, <coughs> to represent. Uh, can I share my screen? Can you see my screen? Yeah, not yet. You can share your screen, please. Is it tobacco? You can do it now. Can you see my screen? Yes, if you can. Yeah, now it's good. <clears throat> yeah, I won't dwell much on this because I'm going to share the presentation. But we are aware we are dealing with SDGs. And uh, the baseline is that in South Africa, we had uh, only city of Cape Town that uh, uh, rep represented us in, uh, in 2019. However, as an organization, we, we took an initiative uh, to support our members to write voluntary local reviews. But at the high level, uh, the country has been uh, reporting on SDGs. Uh, and then we, we submitted our proposal to UN, UNDP, UNDESA to also support us on these initiatives. What we did, we took bigger cities to come and work with us. Buffalo City, Etequini, City of Tswane, and City of Johannesburg. Those, those were the biggest uh, cities out of the eight uh, to participate in the program. But this is how we are. Uh, uh, um, professor, as, 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 excuse me, Professor. There is a, uh, there is a, uh, something uh, which disturb your intervention. <coughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, we are hearing you, please. Yeah, so so we, we have three spheres of government, uh, local government, provincial government, and national government. One of the things that we raised was that everything happens at local government. Uh, you, can, you can't exclude uh, all of us. So this is how we are probably, you know, we've got eight metros, 44 district, 205 local municipalities. Just just look at from, from that, we only took eight uh to to work with us based on our intergovernmental relations framework which designed to facilitate cooperation and coordination amongst the different spheres of government nationally provincially and local so in our sessions that we we started we started by having uh, five of the uh, uh, cities that are working with us including city of cape town to start to work with us but what we did we selected municipalities from different sphere when we started the program to create awareness, mobilize and commit a public and local government to the construction of fair and sustainable cities. But bear in mind, we've got challenges against the uh, SDG number five and number 10 uh, regarding inequalities and promoting of human rights and social control under SDG number 16. But th this is where we are. This is where we are with subsidiarity. I'm not gonna go through it because these are the things that, as a country, we are we are support to be working on, like providing democratic, accountable government for local communities and provide social and economic development. The key one is that we need a healthy nation uh, to work on that. But two places distinguish between the subsidiarity and institutional subsidiarities. But here are the challenges, as I, I was given to respond to. <clears throat> The, the, the democratic decentralization was was uh, started also supported by UCLG to redress apartheid legacies and chart a participatory developmental path. Yes, we've got uh, a, an IDP, which is called Integrated Development Plan, where municipalities are engaging communities. However, there's unequal distribution of the means of production and infrastructure power. If you follow us, most of the time, <coughs> excuse me, you find that uh, if there's a service delivery strike, residents are marching, but they also uh, uh, destroy the property. But these are the issues that we are we are also working on. Uh, the political resistance, Madam Chair, uh, is something that due to concern about losing control over resources, they end up not uh, 
decentralizing some of the work uh, for local government to do its own work. Uh, and I was telling Treasury the other time, you can't celebrate taking money from local government because you are the core face of uh, service delivery uh, to ensure that we, we support that. The vision of, of decentralization has not been translated into corporate reality in municipalities, uh, but we are, we, are, we are getting there through this program so that we are able to support municipalities. The capacity issue, it's one of the key issues. When we started the program, Madam Chair, we, we had a challenge of uh, getting people that understand why should we do sustainable development goal and so that we reach the, the goal of 2030. But we realized that most of them didn't have a capacity uh, to work on this. So it's gonna take us some time, even though we were left with uh, less than seven years to do this work. But there's a thing that you start by sharpening the, the blade. By the time it's tried to chop, it will also be able to do its part. The, this lack of uh, capacity, Madam Chair, it's also through uh, affecting municipalities through planning. And, and we are saying we need to focus more on SDG number 11, but look at how it's related to other SDGs. Because the, the, the colleague that I supported wanted to do all of them. We said, no, let's see if there is synergy between other SDGs, because you can't run SDG number 11 without six, without seven, without nine, without 16, and 13 and 17. However, when you do everything, you are responding to SDG number one, no poverty. Uh, so, so one of the other things, Chair, is lack of fund to local sphere responsibilities. It came to them as an unfunded mandate. So, so part of our opportunities that we talk about is that uh, we really need to uh, have a, a, a way to ensure that municipalities are also budgeting for this, for this work through our lobbying uh, processes. The political administrative interference has limited the ability of municipalities to carry out their duties and provide the goods and services for, for, for voters. One of the key things that I think all of us were struggling with, it's lack of data to accelerate SDG. I think all of us, we were struggling with that, but we, we engage stats, they are working with us uh, as other partners. And we're saying this project, it's all about partnership of partnership within a partnership of the partnership to ensure that we accelerate the SDGs. There are things that is also affecting us, Madam Chair, and the, and the, the people at large is that we are experiencing municipal coalitions and that is also affecting us to be able to align the integrated development plans with SDGs. So we need time to show them how this thing is, 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 is happening. One of the issues is, is corruption which we need to address as a country uh, by strengthening anti-corruption measures and promoting good governance. So we're working with Michael and, and, and Colin in our program of uh, voluntary local reviews to strengthen that part. Lack of accountability is one of the things. Uh, ethics and tribal dynamics are those. Recentralization, which should be a restorative measures for administrative type functionality. We have Auditor General no money. We audit our municipalities so that they are able to get uh, a good governance on, on, their, on their work. The challenge for national and government is to implement this decentralization re re uh, as a measure in a temporary but strategic and purposeful manner. But we, we realize that it's a, it's a, it could change service delivery and perspectives on decentralization. But our constitution is clear. I'm not gonna go to that. What we pick it up is that nearly half of our municipalities do also not have engineers on their staff, but this is a key that we need to ensure that at least to a national and provincial, decentralize some of the work. We put these people in our municipalities because asset management is very key for service delivery and for climate change issues. Because you, are, you should be able to respond to uh, uh, or be resilient to what we put. Uh, another issue is that hamper the local government. It's a amount of legislation that complicates and governs local government because it's a, everybody's fear and it's becoming too complex. New, can we conclude, uh, dear uh, professor, please? Yes, we, we developed this for our municipalities. We call it Salga SDG Hub Centric. It's live now. These are the municipalities that we, we are supporting 
but this is how we align IDP goals and objective uh, with our municipalities. This is what we did so that they can be aware of what is happening. But value to municipalities, new opportunities for funding, uh, it presents a practical, useful agenda for political and administrative leaders in municipalities. But it's a new culture of partnership between municipal administration. What we did is that we are now seeing municipalities start to work together, Madam Chair. So uh, the other value is that uh, we are doing this to promote regional development <coughs> and resolving some of the conflict within our sector. Madam Chair, this is where we're going. What we are going to do is that we are also going to work with UN Habitats to start a national urban planning forum to deal with issues that are focusing on SDG number 11, 9, 13, 16, 17. But leave no one behind, Madam Chair. Uh, focus on, on uh, uh, the gender issues because they are very key. Awareness is what we are doing at Salga. Uh, when we play in the World Cup, we had this uh, awareness campaign, promotional material, uh, and the soccer ball. There's Clarissa who's coordinating the project on behalf of Salga when we work. So, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Uh, no one knows everything. Everyone knows something. All knowledge resides in network. And the SDG network like this one, it's where municipalities and all of us are learning on how to ensure that at least we achieve the 2030 target. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, colleague, Professor Tibego, for sharing with us the uh, main challenge faced by uh, the local government in South Africa. And I uh, noticed the political resistance, the capacities, the lack of resources, and uh, the inflation of legal instrument. And it's not limited to South Africa. It's uh, an African uh, issue. Uh, the issue of accountability uh, also is very uh, important. Um, and uh, you share with us some uh, best practices, including how you're supporting uh, the local government, provincial uh, uh, government in uh, the voluntary uh, local review and voluntary subnational uh, review. It was also highlighted by Professor Bala. Thank you very much. Uh, with the this presentation, we will move to the uh, last speaker for this uh, segment. Uh, we will uh, shift our perspective to the efforts in the region with our uh, fourth guest speaker, namely Mr. Isaka Garba Abdu, who is uh, the head governance and human rights uh, division uh directorate of for governance and conflict prevention african union commission mr uh, uh, isaka garba uh, has uh, occupied various other uh, position as a senior political officer within uh, african uh, union and also we used to uh, collaborate with him thank you mr uh, isaka for being here and the floor is yours Your mic, please, Isaka. Activate your mic, please. Yeah, thanks so much, Madam Moderator, for giving me the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, African Union is a uh, is a uh, is honored to to intervene at this very important event. Uh, from the African Union perspective, so. Decentralization and also subsidiarity and all the principles of subsidiarity are at the heart of the African Union mandate. And uh, this can be seen through uh, the, 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 the role that the Agenda 2063 uh, uh, plays, you know, focus on the implication of local authority, the community, and also it's people centered. And also when you look at uh, the African Charter, the decision by head of state and government to create, to, to, to adopt the, the African Charter on value and principle of public uh, of decentralization of local, uh, govern, govern, local governance and local development. It is a key message on, on the ambition or the intention of the AU uh, uh, willing to promote, protect, and act as a catalyst for decentralization, and also to promote 
and champion local governance and local democracy as one of the cornerstone of the uh, decentralization in Africa. And also the, the charter seek to also promote resource mobilization, local economic development with the view to eradicate poverty in Africa, and also to promote the chair understanding of a common vision of the member state on the matter related to decentralization, local governance and local de uh, development. One other decision, important decision is also uh, coming from the head of state to create an African Union High Council of Local Authority to, pro to promote local community uh, participation to the decision-making process at the African Union level. So these are <clears throat> at the regional level, how this principle of subsidiarity and decentralization is very important for uh, the African Union. And the uh, African Union also facilitating partnership between member states to share best practices and resources for effective decentralization. So when we talk about uh, best practices, it's important here to, to highlight some key uh, best practices on the continent. You know, when you look at Rwanda local governance and healthcare improvement has made a significant strident in improving health care access through decentralization. The government has empowered local health management team and also community health worker that have been in key in increasing healthcare coverage at the grassroots level. This has contributed to Rwanda's progress in achieving SDG3, good health and well-being with marked reduction in child, child, child uh, mortality and improvement of maternity health. When you look at also Morocco solar power decentralization, for example, we call it Morocco Nur Warzazat complex, is one of the world largest solar plant, which is part of national strategy to harness solar energy. And decentralization has, made, has been crucial in this project with local authorities uh, playing a significant role and in land allocation and also the project management uh, contribution to SDG 7, affordable and clean energy and SDG uh, 13, climate action. And also the uh, one third point also is Kenya devolution and the local development, uh, local economic development, which is a form of political decentralization that has brought government closer to the people with counties now having the power and resources to drive local economic development. So as uh, we don't have enough uh, time, I don't have enough time. I will go also, I will highlight some key challenges. For sure, uh, we, we have challenges in the, in the sense of absence of bringing decision-making process closer to the beneficiaries, as well as also the responsiveness and the effectiveness of the service that is delivered. So we, when you look at also some major global trends such as urbanization, climate change, and technology advancement, they have also some kind of potential impact on the centralization of local governance in the sense that the absence of resources and the lack of capacity to accompany local community to address these challenges is also an issue. And we have also other uh, challenges like the elite dominance in certain cases, and also the limited administrative expertise as key hurdles in, in, in subsidiarity and decentralization. Now we can have some recommendation like, uh, like innovative approach. Uh, can we please, uh, dear, dear Isaka, can we uh, please conclude? Okay, just to conclude on the recommendation, innovative approach, I think, and technology could support more effective local governance, such as digital platform for participatory uh, decision-making process, and the, the implementation of transparency, accountability, and community monitoring to reduce risk in decentralized, decentralized governance. I can stop here, and I thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Isaka, for your... Uh uh speech about uh, the uh, african union perspective and you uh, share with us uh, some of the legal instrument adopted and implemented by uh, african union uh, member states uh, also working on resource mobilization which is very important 
You also shared some best practices coming from Rwanda for healthcare, from Morocco for solar plan, and from Kenya, the local economic development at the county levels. And you uh, conclude by sharing with us some challenge. And I noticed the elite dominant. And also, you suggest that we focus on technology participatory approach and also fighting corruption and investing in transparency. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Isaka, for your uh, uh, presence and your speech. With this uh, presentation, we have uh, finished the first part of our, um, the first segment of our agenda. And uh, I will ask for the help of uh, Praben or Anna if there is any uh, questions, comments from uh, our uh, audience and which speaker they are targeting, please. There is, uh, I can take one or two. Any questions? Yes, Anna? they are. Yes, they are some questions um, for the speakers. Uh, some has been responded, Ms. Najat. I think um, maybe we can take you can take maybe one of of them. Let me find out for uh, the, the representative of Nigeria. I sent it to yeah. you. Yes, I have it. So uh, this is for uh, Professor uh, Bala to the representative of uh, Nigeria. What are you doing? to keep girls and women safe in the country, SDG 5 uh, target 2-1 uh, states that all forms of violence against all women and girls in the public and private spheres, including trafficking and other types of exploitation must be eliminated. Professor uh, Bala, um, feedback? Th th thank you so much. Um, just like... Uh... Um, this question is unfortunate. Um, I mean, uh, the situation we are, it's, it's quite unfortunate. Yeah, we have um, insecurity challenges um, undermining uh, progress towards the achievement of uh, the entire SDG, uh, not only SDG 8. Yeah, there are pockets of uh, um, kidnappings, uh, school children um, across, especially the North east and northwestern parts of Nigeria. Uh, but this is a security challenge that the security um, uh, agencies are doing everything humanly possible. The president has given orders for uh, to the military authorities uh, to make sure that uh, this insecurity is brought to, to an end uh, so that people uh, can enjoy peace and prosperity um, uh, across the country. Um, this is what I would say for now. Uh, I, I lead the technical coordination of the implementation of the SDGs, and these are strictly uh, security challenges. And like I've said, uh, the government is uh, it's, it's doing everything humanly possible to, uh, to make sure that uh, children, girls, women are safe wherever they are, whether in school or in the communities. Uh, otherwise, the SDGs cannot be achieved. Um, with, uh, in a situation of insecurity. And we all know the relationship also between um, uh, uh, security and national development. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Professor uh, Bala. Do we have time to take uh, one more question? Um, unfortunately not. Okay. So thank you very much to our uh, speakers for the first uh, segment of our agenda. And now uh, we will move to the second one about strategies to uh, operationalize the principle of uh, subsidiarity. Uh, we will move then to uh, our uh, speakers. And it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Patrick Spirin, Secretary of the Committee of Experts on Public Administration to deliver a brief introduction of the uh, guidance notes. And allow me to uh, highlight the fact that uh, Patrick, he uh, has served in uh, positions at the United Nations supporting multi-stakeholders consultation and deliberation. He was also a uh, departmental focal point on governance within the UN system 
task team convened in the lead up to the 2030 uh, agenda and we used to uh, rely on his support during our uh, work, all our work in uh, the SIPA. Thank you, Patrick, for being here and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator, and of course, always a pleasure to see you and other colleagues. I'll be very quick uh, since time is short, and I'm sure you want to leave uh, enough room for the interactive discussion at the end between the experts and the, uh, and, the and the other participants. So, some uh, participants may be wondering where these where these so-called strategies or practice areas uh, come from under the principle of subsidiarity, and uh, I can say quite simply that they are not out of the air. They come from various uh, UN treaties, resolutions and commitments uh, adopted over many years. So the point of these guidance notes and the engagement of the expert consultants is to try to put some flesh on the operationalization of these particular uh, uh, practice um, areas. Uh, the set of strategies, uh, fiscal federalism and decentralization, strengthening municipal finance, uh, strengthening urban governance and so on are not exhaustive. Uh, there are other ways of thinking about subsidiarity and decentralization, obviously, but we hope that they provide a solid foundation for making progress on strengthening subnational authorities and intergovernmental relations. Uh, they also uh, are not a checklist of things that countries have to be doing. None of the principles or the strategies that are associated with those principles are, are must do necessarily, but depend a lot on the priorities of a country and, uh, and subnational authorities uh, and the particular context. And we've heard about the, the, some of the issues that are faced by countries such as Malawi, Nigeria, South Africa, by the African continent in general, and others as highlighted in the chat, having to do with uh, building up uh, subnational authorities in the context of peace building, conflict prevention, uh, questions of inclusion, and also uh, in relation to specific uh, sectoral um, issues having to do with education, health, housing, infrastructure, inequalities, public safety, livelihoods, corruption, uh, the, and the list the list goes on. We've heard we've heard met from many of these examples already in the in the in the discussion. So the uh, in the guidance notes that will be presented by the experts, you'll hear about what these strategies are, what the current situation uh, is in the public sector how to go about implementing them, where there are opportunities for peer learning, where there are opportunities for engaging with international development partners, and maybe some uh, case uh, examples uh, to highlight what is being discussed um, in the notes. We hope very much that you find the work helpful in thinking about uh, concrete and action-oriented initiatives that can move the needle forward on the achievement of national sustainable development objectives. And we uh, also want to point out that this principle of subsidiarity is part of a larger uh, set of principles, a larger, or larger framework uh, of effective governance for sustainable development, as mentioned uh, at, at the beginning. And you can find out more about this larger framework of effective governance, um, dealing with questions of effectiveness, accountability, and so on. Um, within which subsidiarity is situated uh, by looking at our and our website and we're happy to help you find the material if you if you need. I finally want to acknowledge the excellent work of these uh, experts who are going to present today and really uh, thank them uh, uh, profoundly uh, for the contribution that they've made to thinking about these issues and to helping countries uh, advance on the subsidiarity for sustainable development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, for your uh, insightful introduction. Uh, we have uh, indeed five uh, experts uh, presentation. So let us start with the first uh, speaker and experts, Professor Paul Smoke, who is a professor of public finance and uh, planning at uh, Robert uh, Wagner Graduate School of Public Service in New York University. Professor uh, Paul uh, teaches courses on public uh, finance, development uh, planning, governance, and development assistance in developing countries. And he serves on the Economic Advisory uh, Council of the Millennium Challenge Corporation and the Advisory Board of the Local Public Sector Alliance. Professor Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, hello to everyone. It's uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, my presentation is a bit of an overview, and then some of the people who follow me will go into a bit more detail. Uh, I'm um, 
particularly pleased to uh, be with you today because Africa is uh, the uh, area that uh, I have uh, uh, worked in a lot. My own work has uh, concentrated on, and um, I uh, actually uh, have have lived and worked in Africa before I uh, got into academia. So um, I'm doing the overview on fiscal federalism and decentralization, <laughs> and the we've already gone through, I think, the fact that decentralization has been very important and the previous speakers and Patrick also emphasized that low and middle income countries have pursued decentralization for a variety of reasons. So I won't um, go through all of these, but the, the basic idea behind uh, subsidiarity is that achieving any of these goals is based on the expected greater subnational uh, knowledge of local conditions and needs and their closer connection to local people compared to central government. A big piece of the rationale for decentralization and subsidiarity is a public finance theory known as fiscal federalism, and that's what I'm uh, going to focus on. Now, this looks like it might be a complicated chart, but it's not really. There is the theory of public finance is about what is the role of government in the economy to help stabilize and redistribute resources, um, but also to deliver services to to uh, meet public functions. And this is the the principle of subsidiarity basically says that, as we've already heard, that these functions should go to the lowest possible subnational level. And so what fiscal federalism does is it's, it lays out a set of principles for us to think about what functions should be assigned to various levels of government, what finances do they need to provide those functions, and in what ways might they interact with the private sector. And so the, the basic fiscal federalism model is economic principles. It's textbook principles. And they get us in the right direction to think about what local government should do. But as we've heard very clearly from the previous speakers, the political and institutional context is what really determines this. And so the principles are used to say, what are local functions? And then one of the golden rules of fiscal federalism is finance follows function. So once you determine what the responsibilities are, then you have to make sure that they have the finances to provide those services. And these can be local revenues like property taxes. They can be transfers that support the, rev the general revenue base of subnational governments, but also help meet other national goals for uh, certain priorities that are important. Um, there's their local services, but they have a larger impact on uh, the whole country. And also transfers can be used to redistribute resources to poorer places that can't raise their, their own revenues. And for infrastructure development, particularly in bigger cities under the right conditions, you might be able to uh, borrow um, or uh, have private sector financing. So we don't have time to go through the principles, but this is basically what the paper um, outlines. And I wanted to highlight just a few points about this. The elements of fiscal federalism obviously need to be integrated. So again, if you, if you ask local governments to provide a service, you have to make sure they have the revenue. But there are also ways in which the other elements uh, can interact with what the local governments do. So for example, one of the problems that people complain about with uh, intergovernmental transfers is that if the national government is giving uh, resources to richer cities, then they might those cities might not want to collect the local revenue that they're legally allowed to collect. And it means that places that don't need to be subsidized as much are being subsidized 
at the expense of the poorer places that cannot raise their own revenue. So these elements are, imp, uh, are integrated. And this last point, um, beyond the physical elements, as we've seen uh, from what the previous speakers said, that effective uh, fiscal decentralization depends on administrative and political decentralization. There have to be the powers to plan, to budget, to manage, and uh, they have to have the autonomy through political decentralization for the local governments to be able to meet the needs of the, of the local people. And this is just a table you can look at another time, but um, the basically it just shows that subnational government expenditures and revenues as a share of GDP and total expenditures and revenues are lower and particularly low in the lowest develop, uh, developing countries, the lowest income developing countries compared to the higher income. And so the obviously an important role of fiscal decentralization is to try to increase this role um, for the uh, countries in the lower income categories. Uh, just a few last things before I wrap up and we move on to others. Uh, as again, I think has been demonstrated by the previous speakers, there is no best assignment of subnational government functions and revenues. The principles tell you how, what you ought to be thinking about, but the fiscal federalism principles have to be compatible with economic, institutional, political, and cultural contexts, both with, uh, across countries and within countries, because there are differences within countries. And we've already talked about, the previous speakers have highlighted, I think, quite well, a lot of the common um, implementation challenges, um, maybe not so much the economic realities where uh, local governments may have limited or narrow economic bases and be faced with pervasive poverty. But I think there have been plenty of examples given about the lack of good information to design and manage systems and the lack of empirical evidence regarding what actually works. Um, and then the capacity constraints and political realities, I think, have been um, well covered. So the, I want to close by saying the problem with using fiscal federalism is that what the principles will tell you is a system that's over here. And what many countries have, whether they're already legally decentralized or not, is over here. And the, the distance between what the principles tell you should happen and where you are now is large. And so you cannot do it all at once. And something that I think is deeply neglected in the application of uh, fiscal federalism is strategic implementation. What are the appropriate starting points and how do you sequence reforms to get to where you want to go? How do you use piloting and experimentation before mainstreaming reform design? Often I think, especially in cases where international donors are involved, uh, you have experts coming in using the principles to tell you what you ought to do. Test it, test it before you use it and then scale it up. How do you create incentives for everyone to adopt reforms? Under decentralization, national government um, ministries have to behave differently. They have to have more trust and, and give more authority to local governments. And local governments have to take that authority and be accountable to their people. How do we uh, how do we use the strategy to enhance capacity development for the things that are going on right now? And how do we change? One of the big problems with decentralization programs in many countries is that there's a program and everybody says we have to stick to it. But if you find that there are mistakes, change it, fix it. Um, and how do you work effectively with international development partners interested in providing support? In many cases, the international development partners are pushing somewhat different things. And ultimately, it's the responsibility of the country to figure out how to use fiscal federalism, how to use fiscal decentralization in a way that works for them. And the international development partners have to support that. And I think that is it. 
um, happy to um, take any questions uh, from people over email um, as uh, or, or however you want to try to find me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Smoke, for your uh, uh, clear presentation about the fiscal federalism and decentralization. And I noticed uh, the necessity to have a credible intergovernmental fiscal system and uh, to assure an effective fiscal decentralization, we need a concrete local autonomy, meaning an appropriate administrative, political, and institutional decentralization. You noticed also there is less fiscal decentralization in uh, middle and low income countries, and the national context is, uh, is uh, crucial. You highlight some challenge like the economic and political realities the lack of data, the weaknesses in technical managerial and uh, governance capacities, and you advocate for a strategic strategic implementation strategies uh, backed by uh, capacity development. And I will add the uh, political will and also the mindset change and transformative leadership at all levels of governance. Thank you very much. And now I would like to uh, invite our second speaker, Professor Astrid Haas, urban economist and uh, adjunct professor at the School of Cities at the University of Toronto. Uh, professor Haas uh, is an independent uh, urban economist working in both research and practice, supporting cities around strategy uh, generally and uh, specifically to strengthen their financial system with a focus on uh, Unleashing new opportunities for subnational financing. Professor Astrid, the floor is yours. Thank you. After all these uh, all these Zoom conversations, I still don't find the mute button. Um, so very many thanks, Neda, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's great to be able to go after uh, Paul um, because he provided the, the framework in which now I'm going to sort of try and flesh it out, caveated that we don't have a lot of time. So I encourage everyone to go to the guidance note um, that is written on this on strengthening municipal and local finance systems, where much more detail is provided. Um, I think, next slide, please. Um, so, Underpinning everything that we've talked about and all the previous speakers in terms of achieving SDGs, achieving the localization of SDGs is money. We need uh, that we need the financing at a local level to be able to implement, to be able to um, develop. And underpinning a local finance system is sound public financial management. Now, within the guidance note, we go through some sort of very basic structures that you see here on the screen. Um, of what is core to strengthening local and financial management systems in each of these areas. So I'm going to now briefly go through each one in turn, um, but again, encouraging you to actually go to the guidance note to see, see more details as well as case study examples. Um, next slide, please. So Paul mentioned that uh, function should uh, finance should follow function. Even be, uh, before that, there needs to be a vision. Um, the local government or whoever is setting the budget needs to have a plan. It needs to be able to understand what its priorities are uh, for investments over a medium to longer period of, uh, period of time. This is because resources are constrained and so trade-offs need to be made. And a credible way of doing this is through capital investment planning, which is essentially just a list of prioritized projects for investments. Um, it helps uh, local governments, uh, local municipal governments be able to, as I said, prioritize what they want to spend on. Um, it helps provide uh, cost projections, so understanding then what you need to spend and therefore what you need to be raised, uh, what you need to raise. It understands if you're borrowing what your fiscal space is, i.e. how much you've borrowed and how much you need to repay over time. Um, and importantly, now a lot of capital investment plans also um, look at climate smart alternatives. So you can build in climate considerations right into the plan. Beyond being an important strategy document for local and municipal governments, this is also a credible signal 
uh, to investors that your priorities won't change. So if investors want to lend you money over a longer term, they want to understand that as a local and municipal government, this is indeed your priority over the medium to long term and therefore the, the repayment will happen. So, so this, this capital investment plan is both key as an internal planning document, but both, uh, but as well as an external credibility marker. Next slide, please. Once the vision is there, once the, the, the priorities have been set, then the question is how to finance and fund the priorities and operationalize them. And that's, that's where the budget comes in. Now, budget cycle processes will necessarily be context specific. Different countries will have different rules on when and how the budget cycle happens. And also what role local and municipal governments will play within that budget cycle. Um, in general, the more decentralized the country, the stronger the role will be for the municipal and, and or local government to play in terms of setting their budget. But overall, there will always be a role and the budget cycle will, will generally or should generally follow um, these four stages. So a strategic stage um, where it's important to get stakeholder input and that stakeholders beyond government. So also from constituencies and this helps set the, the target. So budgeting is usually done annually um, for the year. Uh, a needs assessment. So how much money is needed? How much money are we going to, to, to raise? Um, and what's going to be the capital and operating budget, which I'll, I'll come to shortly. Uh, a review by necessary stake stakeholders um, and approvals. Uh, and finally, the implementation. But with the implementation, it's also really important to have a strong monitoring and evaluation mechanism um, to be able to assess how you've met your targets, where maybe you've failed to meet your targets, and therefore maybe where you need to address, uh, adjust for, for future budgeting cycles. Uh, next slide, please. And the budget is obviously made up of, of various components. Um, the one that that we we generally and and I work with a with a lot of city governments. The one that we generally like to talk about is how we raise the money. Um, so where the money is going to come from. Again, revenue assignments um, are going to be allocated differently um, depending on uh, various factors, including the level of decentralization. And uh, Paul spoke about that briefly um, in his previous presentation. Um, but particularly when we talk about, you know, best practices in revenue assignments, it's about how we can make sure that we raise money um, at the most at the most suitable level of government. And so some examples are are given here. So Najat, I see you. I don't know whether that means my time is nearly up. So maybe I should uh, should, should speed up. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, transfers, as has been discussed, make up a large part of own source revenues. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, however, as uh, Honorable Rebecca mentioned before, it can constrain local governments if transfers have too many conditionalities attached to them. So thinking about how transfer policy is, is also an indication that local and national uh, governments need to work together in terms of, 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 of um, local and municipal finance systems. Uh, next slide, please. Importantly for local governments is where they can raise money themselves, because this tends to be the money that they are able to uh, to allocate for their own needs and resources. Um, there's various ways local governments can raise money. Perhaps the most important one um, is property and land tax. Um, I don't have any time to go into this in further detail. Um, there has been a lot written about this, and I urge um, for those who don't, um, who have not encountered the benefits of this tax, to go into it. But this is perhaps one of the most important yet underutilized taxes for for most local governments around the world, and has a lot of potential with administrative reforms to increase revenues. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm speeding through this in, in the interest of time, but again, more detail to be found um, in the guidance note. Uh, next slide, please. And then, of course, there's also user fees. User fees are an important source of revenue that local governments don't tend to like to use um, because people complain about, uh, <laughs> about having to pay for services. But local governments have to cover their costs. Uh, everything comes with a cost. Um, providing services comes with a cost. And so when setting user fees, it's important um, to think about meeting the cost of providing that service, but also taking into account things like affordability, particularly for more mar marginalized and vulnerable populations. Um, so user fees are, again, an important yet 
particularly in the African context, underutilized um, source of potential revenue, but obviously should be set and used um, with caution to uh, what local populations can afford and so need uh, to ensure that they can continue to meet their needs. Next slide, please. On the other side of the, the equation is the expenditures. This is the functions that Paul was talking about. Um, these again will be developed, will be determined by legislation. Important here is to think about capital expenditures. So these are the expenditures you're making into long-term infrastructure and development and recurrent expenditures, expenditures you need to make on a reoccurring basis. Um, uh, and a lot of, in African contexts, um, a lot of recurrent expenditures are paid, uh, are used to cover wage and salary costs. Uh, in general, um, we want to shift the 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 expenditure profile to take into account more long term spending and capital expenditures because this is what drives productivity Here, and development. Dear Astrid, can yes, we I shall wrap up shortly. Minutes? Please, sure, yeah, please. Care okay, next slide. And then finally, there's borrowing, but borrowing is 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 really. It comes at the end of once you've sort of strengthened your revenue systems and uh, is highly constrained uh, for most African local governments, um, both as a result of legislation, but also credit worthiness. So a lot can be done around this. And I know uh, UCLG, for example, is, is one uh, organization that is looking into this. Next slide. Finally, local governments have a lot of assets, uh, and these are not usually considered, particularly land. And so creating an asset register is a really important way of strengthening uh, budget and financial systems. Um, and this is really reflects the overall public wealth, but is also then um, what you can use if you can borrow, what you can also borrow against. So assets should be considered, but are usually forgotten as part of a public financial management system. Um, and I think the next slide is the final slide. But just to say, all of this is very dependent on the social contract. So if you're going to, to do strong public financial management, it has to be also visible to those who are paying taxes and user fees for them to be able to comply. Um, and this can unleash a positive cycle um, and, and through this strength in local and municipal financial systems. So let me leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Astrid, for this uh, presentation that has focused on the link between, and I appreciate it, between the social contract and the capital investment plan, the necessity to set uh, local priorities, and this is really the uh, most important uh, problem and, and weaknesses at local level. Uh, in a um, rapid urbanization, uh, and also uh, extensive decentralization uh, movement. We need to uh, invest uh, more and more in uh, funding and financing uh, the vision, the plans, the budget of the local uh, government. She uh, also did the mapping of uh, what we mean by the resources, the revenues, the expenditures and the asset of local governments. And sometimes they don't, they don't have an idea about all these elements. So we need really to multiply more and more uh, events like uh, the one we have today. Thank you very much. And uh, now we are uh, moving to our next speaker. I would like to invite uh, Professor Anna Leider, Associate Professor in the Department of Political Economy at King's College uh, London to uh, deliver her uh, presentation. Professor uh, Anna, uh, research and uh, teaching interest center on comparative uh, political economy with a particular focus on transformation of the welfare state and their impact on uh, patterns of inequality. More specifically, she studied the effect of decentralization reforms on territorial inequalities. Professor Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, for this lovely introduction. Um, it's hard to follow up such good presentations uh, that came before me, but uh, but I'll try my best. So I will um, elaborate on a concept that is perhaps a little more unheard of than decentralization, which is multi-level governance. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So essentially, multi-level governance is a term or field of study developed to understand 
multiple authority shifts away from the national level. Those can be shifts upwards to international organizations such as the United Nations, but also downward shift to um, regional tiers or local tiers. And we know that these shifts have been increasing ever since the end of the Second World War because of various political processes such as uh, democratization. Um, so we can define the term as essentially a system of, of governance where shares are distributed or, or tasks are distributed across these uh, different um, tiers. Um, next slide, please. Um, now, obviously, a key question here is. Um, why have countries moved towards this seemingly more complex way of organizing governance or government? Or why should governments move towards this in the future? Well, the key benefit of a multi-level governance system is what we call scale flexibility. Um, and it has been touched upon a little bit by the earlier presentations already. And it just means that it allows um, the level of governance to be adjusted to the exact territorial scale at which a particular policy is most efficiently provided. Um, so some policies might be better provided at the central level uh, or even international level, if we think um, environmental protection, if we think um, you know building a resilient infrastructure, all of which are sustainable um, development goals. But other goods are clearly more efficiently provided at the local level. And that is particularly the case when preferences vary sharply across regions within a country. And local governments are more apt at summarizing these diverse preferences and ex uh, at expressing these diverse preferences. Um, and actually, relating to my other uh, field of study, which is social policy, it's particularly in those areas like social policy, healthcare, education, that um, involve a face-to-face -face delivery where local governments are particularly good at summarizing preferences and at tailoring um, the delivery to local preferences. And I'll add one last point, just because it's... Um, particularly relevant to multi-ethnic countries and multi-ethnic societies, multi-level governance has actually been shown to help preserve peace in multi-ethnic societies as it first of allows the expression of these diverse preferences and it allows diversity among linguistic and cultural groups by giving them some autonomy and thereby giving them the sense of being protected from the abuse of, of central authority. Now, obviously, multi-level governance or decentralization also is associated with a number of risks. Um, and one of those is that um, it increases transaction costs um, of coordinating across these multiple jurisdictions. And there's extra administrative overheads um, involved in generating multiple jurisdictions. Um, and these transaction costs only ever increase or can be uh, um, blown out of proportion if there are additional political and partisan dynamics um, that come into play at where um, ideology differs across different levels and um, can lead to quite conflictual um, relations. And um, next slide, please. Um, so when we're talking about current uh, public sector trends and what's going on, it's important to highlight that there's a lot of variation in the way countries have structured their multi multi-level systems. There's no one size fits all. Um, but what um, it generally helps is to think about this variation in terms of two distinct properties of these systems. One refers to um, sort of what I call the centralization decentralization dimension, which is where in a system is authority of a particular policies located? Is it more at the local level, more at the regional, level, more at the national level? Um, but a second very important property is what I call the autonomy interdependence dimension. It is not where is authority located, but how do levels relate to one another? Um, and the, the key aspect here is 
um, is the system mostly um, emphasizing autonomous spheres of action where the different levels um, act independently of one another autonom uh, autonomously, or does it create high levels of interdependence where the levels are mutually dependent on one another? And that is usually the result of sharing legislative competencies over the same policy area or um, the result of assigning legislative authority to one level but implementation to another level which can also create this high level of um, interdependence and next slide please and so if we think about the consequences for multi-level governance um, for policy making, it's actually a function of how these two different properties are combined, right? So we can have a highly decentralized country like um, like Canada, where actually the spheres are largely autonomous. They act in, in sort of watertight compartments, and that creates the absolute maximum um, decision making leeway at the subnational level, which um, can be positive as it invites like, experimentation and competition, et cetera, but which can also create quite high levels of territorial inequality. Um, in Germany, we have the combination of a very decentralized system with very high levels of interdependence. So where a lot of tasks are shared. Now, um, that restricts a little bit the decision-making leeway, um, but also it really increases the transaction costs, right? So not coordinating or not cooperating in systems that emphasize interdependence is very costly and can lead to, to, to high problems. South Africa is a, is a very interesting case because it also seeks to emphasize interdependence and um, it's not quite as decentralized, but they're seeing some of the similar dynamics in, in South Africa as, as well. And um, next slide, please. Um, so if you think about how to implement these systems and what kind of practical advice we can give to implement, um, well, if we think about the first property, so where should we locate authority in a multi-level system? Well, we should ideally assign the functions to the territorial level where um, they're, they're most efficiently provided. Um, and so Paul has uh, uh, given us a couple of ideas of where that might be, but generally um, uh, policies that benefit from economies of scale should be higher up the territorial ladder. Policies that benefit from these, uh, from being able to express um, uh, uh, diversity in preferences should go uh, lower down the lever. Um, there are other are political aspects that go into these considerations as well. Um, I just wanted to uh, highlight three measures through which we can change sort of where authority is allocated, which is a little bit more practical. So typically, um, changes um, in the allocation of authority require new legislation to be passed. But short of, um, you know, um, overhauling the whole constitution, we can think about temporary contracts between levels of governments, where for a temporary uh, um, uh, or a short amount of time, some tasks are assigned to a different uh, level of government, either upwards or downwards. Um, a third interesting way of changing the allocation of authority is to think about creating um, jurisdictions that are task specific. So typically that involves several local or regional authorities coming together, joining forces and creating a new task specific uh, jurisdiction. Um, and the idea is that basically this jurisdiction has flexible territorial boundaries that can be adapted um, to the policy problem at hand. So typically we see that with transport authorities that cross over several local governments and that are basically um, ring fencing a particular transport problem. We also see it with airport authorities or certain um, public resource authorities as well. So that is a way of scaling up um, or going up the territorial scale without necessarily changing legislation. One thing I want to pick up on that has been mentioned in the previous panel um, um, regarding the case of South Africa is capacity building. So obviously scaling up or down the territorial scale doesn't just mean giving um, authority to a new level of government, it also means ensuring that that level of government 
has sufficient capacity to carry these responsibilities out. Um, and that can involve fiscal resources, and both Astrid and Paul talked about the fiscal aspect. But sometimes capacity challenges are not just limited to fiscal resources, but also to just um, human resource issues. Is there a skill available at the local and regional level to carry out these uh, resources? Is there enough knowledge? Is there enough uh, experience um, um, at these different levels? Next slide, please. This is my last slide, which relates to the implementation challenges related to the second property, um, which is how do levels relate? Um, and the challenges related to that typically are greater the more interdependence there already is. And those systems that have created a lot of uh, interdependence by sharing different tasks, for instance, benefit hugely from setting up coordinating bodies and those coordinating bodies help manage that mutual dependence. And one such uh, body, for instance, is the um, setting up of meetings between executive level representatives from regions and representatives from central or national governments. And those meetings should be Excuse routinized. Me, Professor Anna, is the last slide? It's the last slide. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and those meetings should be uh, routinized um, and help joint decision making, um, which is really useful, especially if um, both central and subnational governments disagree on certain uh, matters and if um, things become a little bit conflictual. Um, so those meetings can really help solve interdependence issues and help invite collaboration. Not all coordinating bodies need to be as high profile or as formalized. There can be um, less high profile coordinating, coordinating bodies such as uh, working forces or task forces or even specific government agencies and offices that really aim um, at helping different levels find a consensus. So this was my last slide on implementation challenges related to the second property and I hope you find some of these points useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Hanna, for uh, clarifying the concept of multi-level governance uh, from local to subnational uh, level, uh, which, uh, of course, impact the responsibilities, the decision-making process. Uh, I noticed also the cost of having multi-level uh, governance system versus flexibility. Uh, she highlighted also the challenge and risk, like the partisan and the ideological uh, differences between the different levels of governance. Uh, I may add the instability uh, of uh, such uh, change with periodical change in African countries, uh, especially during this current uh, period. Uh, she uh, analyzes also the consequences for the policy making and decision making uh, mechanism between these two options, centralization uh, versus decentralization, autonomy versus interdependence. And maybe allow me to add a third one is the dilution of responsibilities uh, sometimes. So uh, she uh, uh, insists on capacity building and also the uh, efficiency of coordination uh, bodies. Thank you very much, Professor Hanna. And now I invite our uh, I have the honor to invite our four speaker, Professor Alan uh, Lavelle. Uh, Professor uh, Alan is a research associate at the Latin American uh, Social Faculty, Costa Rica, and founding member of the Latin American Network for the Social Study for Disaster Prevention to deliver uh, a presentation on his uh, guidance. And allow me also to uh, add that he's a specialist uh, in urban and regional development. And since uh, 1989, he has been dedicated to uh, the study of uh, disaster risk mm. uh, and climate change and uh, its management. He has written more than 150 chapters, articles, documents, and scientific books on the topics of uh, risk and disaster and urban development mm. besides so many impressive achievement and outstanding for these matters. Professor Allen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And 
Thank you for to the organizers and those attending this meeting for the opportunity um, to speak a little bit um, with a cold, so my voice is not as clear as it should be, um, but to be able to speak to you on this topic um, that in some way we can define as the problem of reducing or managing and avoiding what is commonly called disaster risk. Um, something interesting here in relationship to the other papers is that I'm dealing with a concrete social, economic, political, cultural, historical problem, which is increasing as time goes by. Um, and the other speakers, very interestingly, have laid out many of the elements associated with the way to deal with this, along with other problems in the future. So mine is a problem-oriented talk, whereas those of Astrid and Paul and Brian, when he comes, and Hannah, um, are looking at a lot of the mechanisms, instruments, strategies, which can be used and should be used in order to get on top of the problem that is common. Uh, the problem we're looking at, basically, has, has this misnomer, very serious misnomer of natural disaster. Basically, what we're looking at is the erosion of development benefits, opportunities over time due to the occurrence of um, hazards which have been transformed into damaging events, causing great loss and damage in society. And the type of events which are occurring, we delimit as external, which could be a little bit confusing in many ways, because many are really internal to society, such as earthquakes, hurricanes, biotic factors like COVID, um, flooding, et cetera, and drought. Um, so that's basically what the central concern is. And the concern is the ability for us to be able to reduce the risk which leads to these types of damage and loss, or in some way avoid it in the future. And so when we talk about the capacity at a local level, I'm not going to get into what is local. It is definitely subnational. Um, we will be talking about urban scales, local rural scales, etc. <clears throat> and where there is a governance or government structure which can take up on the challenge and get to it. Um, the idea of capacity building, the other speakers have talked extensively about what that means in terms of knowledge, information, resources, investment, financing, so I won't go into any further detail. And one basic principle we're working on in order to look at this is the idea that disaster risk and consequently disaster is socially constructed. It is not a natural construct. What do we mean by this? This means that it is our actions collectively, individually, family-wise, governments, private sector, um, operating in a world where there are events which can cause damage and loss. It is basically our actions that lead to the risk, the magnitude, the type of risk which exists in society. And consequently, if we construct risk, we can deconstruct risk through a whole series of different activities. And we will be talking about three particular types of disaster risk management strategies. The first is what we call corrective disaster risk management, which is the risk is now on the ground, the hospitals and the schools and the houses are badly located and badly built, and we have to interrupt that process by reducing the risk that's all very there correctively, highly cost, um, cost input, etc. Perspective really relates to the fact that we can anticipate risk and in some ways we can operate with different mechanisms which will avoid that risk is laid out on the ground in the future. This is far more economically viable and economically necessary. And we have compensatory risk management, which is what we do when the event is announced and it has happened and we have to deal with response, reconstruction, rehabilitation, etc. So that is basically where we are. I'm going to deal more not with what we have to do because there isn't time, but basically why is this important? Why from a local level and from a national and international level do we need to consider the whole idea of disaster risk reduction um, complementary to disaster response? 
Firstly, and all of the data show this, and this has been obvious for many decades now, but without the adequate attention, we realize that risk is growing constantly, becoming more complex and more systemic in its effects, affecting areas that have not been directly affected, but to which are linked in some way economically, socially, with other areas of the same country or of other countries internationally. So risk is growing um, tremendously. Um, we also realize that a good part of that risk is being concentrated in urban centers. Risk is increasingly urban as society is increasingly urban. We've now passed for 50 percent. Some, some areas are 80, 85, 90 percent urban. And a lot of the areas that aren't, like Africa, which is 47, 48, is growing and will be predominantly urban in the future. And most risk is concentrated in urban centers and most damage and loss. But one interesting point here is that it is not necessarily in the large metropolitan mega cities that that risk and that damage and loss is expressed. It is more in cities under a million in size and many under 500, which are rapidly growing. And in the future, if we do not intervene in the problem of future disaster risk, we will be facing the same types of risk and levels that we face in the mega cities um, today. This is extremely important for Africa, which, as I say, is 47, 48% urban now, projected to grow a billion in population in urban centers by 2050, double the amount of increased urban populations, which has been experienced between 1990 and 2020. And interestingly enough, if you look at the growth rates of cities over the recent years, the greatest growth rates are in fact in cities that I have never heard of as not being an African specialist. And there are only three or four of the large metropolitan or large cities in the region which reach the 100% increase in urban populations over that time. So for Africa, urban risk in the future and local management of urban risk is going to be extremely important. Um, and if we do not get on top of it before it is, constructed, deconstructing it after will become almost impossible because of the economic costs and the financial layouts needed on engineering works to construct dikes, relocate population, and many other forms of corrective management. And so that brings me to the last point I'd like to make without going into the details, is the insistence on what we call prospective disaster risk management strategies. And these being enacted promoted, identified, supported at the local level with the resources they require. And here I'd make one very interesting point. The fact is that disaster, whether it is large scale intensive or small scale extensive and repetitive, is always experienced at the local level in terms of loss and damage. And the explanation is in the construction of vulnerability, exposure, and hazard manifestation at the local level. However, the local level does not control always the construction of the risk that it has to face. Much risk at a local level is constructed through national non-development policies, I would say, international policies. For instance, a very easy case is that the flooding of lower valley cities is many times caused by deforestation in the upper river basins. Many when changes... The, Professor Allen, one, one uh, minute, minute first. One minute. And um, at an international level, changes in commodity prices can affect seriously risk patterns at a local level. So what we're going to have to do is introduce um, prospective risk management. And prospective risk management is based on existing development strategies and instruments. It isn't something invented by the disaster risk community or shouldn't be. So basically, the principal instruments of prospective management is land use and territorial planning, environmental management, introducing in national investment decisions risk considerations, reduction of poverty and inequality. Consequently, I go back to the point I made just to finish, that the talks by my four, um, um, my th uh, three predecessors and Brian after close in and on 
the idea of introducing disaster risk reduction into the DNA of development and not seeing it as a separate sectoral policy framework. Thank you very much indeed and for the tolerance with time as well. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Alan Lavelle, for this uh, presentation which focus on the existing strategies uh, to tackle and deal with the disaster risk. Uh, also, the challenge to move from a reactive to proactive approach in disaster risk reduction. He also highlight the fact that uh, most uh, risks are uh, concentrated in the urban areas. He insists on uh, the uh, empowering of cities, localities, and communities, and building their capacities to effectively plan mobilize, secure finance, and control uh, risks. And also, they are, uh, local governments are uh, uh, often the victims of uh, risks, uh, which authors or uh, initiators or uh, national or central government. Uh, now, we have uh, uh, our, um, before I give the floor to Professor Brian, I would like to uh, really wish a quick uh, recovery, both for Professor Allen, big, uh, Tibego. Uh, now we have our last uh, speaker is uh, Professor Brian Roberts, uh, which Nazat, you are Better. muted. Sorry, 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 colleagues. So I was saying that uh, the message from Professor Brian will be uh, through a video message. Uh, he's an international urban management expert, uh, has held senior position with the United uh, Nations Center for uh, Human Settlements. He is a co-author uh, of more than 100 publication and conference papers, including 10 books with the contribution to the UN Habitat World Cities Development Report in 2011 and 2015. So please, if the video message is uh, ready, can we share it in the screen? Hello, everyone. Welcome to this short presentation on the strategy guidance notes on urban governance prepared by the Committee of Experts on Public Administration. My name is Brian Roberts and I was one of the principal authors of this guidance note. I just want to spend a few minutes outlining the note and where you can get further information. I want to begin this presentation with a brief discussion on urban governance. Urban governance refers to how governments, in particular and stakeholders, decide how to plan and finance and manage urban areas. It's a continuous process, it involves a lot of contesting of the allocation of resources to different sectors of the economy. It's a very political process. However, it's no longer just the domain of governments. Increasingly, urban governance embraces engagement with business, civil society, and with international organizations, particularly when you're dealing with issues around climate change. The guidance note is presented under six sections. The first part develops our understanding of what urban governance strategy is from a historic to the current context. The second section looks at public sector situation with respect to the applications of urban governance, including broader applications involving public private and community based partnerships. The third looks at implementing urban governance strategy and provides some guidelines on this. Uh, two case studies are introduced, including references to many other case studies, peer-to-peer -peer learning and research, and the final section looks at international development, cooperation and initiatives in the area of urban governance. There are many different stakeholders 
and other interest involved in urban government strategies. These include state governments, local governments, civil society, central governments, international actors, and the informal sector. And depending on the nature of the strategy that's been formulated, be for a project or a program around urban development, urban management, the number of players involved will need to be considered very carefully. Urban governance strategy operates at many different levels and scales. At the local level, it may be concerned with a neighbourhood improvement scheme, how this is organised in partnerships between communities and local government. At the urban region, this will involve consultations with both local communities and with national governments because there are issues of finance, laws and other requirements to be taken into consideration. There are some elements of urban governance strategy will extend into the international sector. This may be in relation to dealing with UNESCO World Heritage Sites, the governance arrangements for that, and also how we localise the implementation of the SDGs. Urban governance strategy is complex and involves the integration of many different functions and societal interests. Urban governance strategies are required for many different purposes. Could be simply for integrated development plan for a region or it could be for a national urban strategy. There are many types of urban governance strategies. All urban governance strategies end up with management arrangements which involve a composite of integrated and interrelated urban interests and responsibilities. The best way to approach the development and implementation of urban governance strategy is to use a systems approach, paying particular attention to multiple functions and responsibilities of agencies, organisations and stakeholders and other party interests involved. There are six key urban governance strategy functions. These are shown in the left hand column of the slide. Uh, more details about these are included in the policy note. It's important to link these functions to the organisations which are responsible for conducting various actions outlined in the strategy. It's also clear to outline the mandates and responsibilities of those organisations, such as the laws and regulations, the processes that are involved, and most importantly is to identify the capacities and capabilities and the resources needed to implement the governance strategy. The guidance note also includes some practical information. There are two case studies and a number of references to others on the web. The first case study looks at delivering metropolitan-wide business services in Verband Stuttgart region of Germany. And the second is on governance arrangements for pooling metropolitan finance in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. There are a number of notes on peer-to-peer -peer learning and research activities, including references to various institutions and organisations that have a key role in the research and development of urban governance services. And finally, the note refers to international development and urban governance cooperation, uh, especially with international development agencies. Urban governance is becoming a matter of significant concern in the management of our towns and cities. 
it's no longer the domain or the responsibility of government. Business, community and civil society interests are involved and in some cases the scope and scale of urban governance strategy will embrace international concerns and interests. I encourage you to read the publication which is available on the UNDP Cabinet of Experts for Public Administration website. Full stop. I thank you for your interest and attention in the presentation today. So allow me now to uh, uh, express our uh, sincere gratitude to all our uh, honorable uh, speakers for this uh, insightful presentation, explanation and uh, sharing good practice from around the world. Uh, we have a few minutes to take some uh, questions from the audience. And I think I have already three. Let me share them with you. For uh, Professor Paul uh, Smok in Nepal, some, are you hearing me, Professor Paul? Uh, yes, I hear you. Yes. So uh, in Nepal, some of the political party politicians do not like provinces institutions and they think the provinces are useless, no work. What is your answer in federal system? Thank you. Okay, well, that is a complicated question. And of course, one of the challenges in Nepal is that you switch to a federal system when you had a different system. And um, that involves um, processes of change and transition that I think maybe were not realized um, at the beginning. I mean, the big challenge in federal systems is to get the right balance between what the provinces or states or whatever the intermediate tier is called and uh, the right balance between them and the lower levels. The biggest challenge in um, federa some federations is that the state or regional governments have a lot of control over the resources that pass to the lower levels. Um, and um, that means that the the uh, cities and local governments uh, tend to be very dependent on those intermediate tiers of government. Um, I I think that figuring out how to get that balance right um, is is the biggest challenge in uh, in federal systems. And you know, in the interest of time, I'd be happy to talk to you individually about it sometime. But um, I haven't worked in Nepal for a while and am not up to date on the current uh, situation. So I think um, I better not uh, uh, say any more um, now, but again, happy to talk to you sometime. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, uh, Paul. The same question is going to uh, Professor Anna, but before giving her the floor, Please, uh, dear uh, participants, we will uh, need to extend beyond the, the allocated time of our uh, workshop. We are asking for your patience and uh, flexibility. Professor Hanna, any reaction to the same question from Nepal? So, basically, how do we address an active dislike um, um, to the intermediate regional tier or basically the perception that it's not useful. Was that, am I summarizing this correctly? Madam moderator. Do you need me to repeat the question? No, I was just summarizing the question. Was that correctly? Is the use uh, of, uh, ha is uh, having provinces in uh, Nepal, some poly party uh, see that it's not necessary to have this level of governance? Yeah. So so yeah, I, I did I did summarize it correctly. Um, well, I think um, how how you would address that question is to um, 
try and think about what is to be gained by the intermediate levels. What tasks are currently, if if you if you allow me that expression, fall between the cracks? Um, so what is not effectively addressed, and how could the regional level come in? there. I mean, um, that is the functional perspective. There might be political reasons why um, there is this opposition to an intermediate tier, right? Is it the fear that it might create competition or that it undermines um, um, some of the, the central government abilities to uh, uh, control policy? Um, and those political um, considerations in opposition to the regional tier are much harder to address than, say, just pure concerns about whether this level is needed or adds to, um, to an efficient policy delivery. Um, without knowing much about the political context of, about in Nepal, I can't say much more about that. But my, my hunch is, is always a mix of the two. Um, so unless you can create um political incentives for um having an intermediate tier for people who want to make their career at an intermediate tier um um and you have opposition it's quite difficult to um to convince people of the usefulness of an intermediate regional tier i hope that sort of addressed the question thank you thank you very much uh, professor anna i have a question to uh, for professor uh, alan lavelle in ghana Professor Allen, you are still with us? Okay, so the question is from Ghana. How can urban governance be integrated for effective marine spatial planning as more attention has been given to land use planning for decades? Thank you. Sorry, I didn't catch the first part of a question. Could you repeat? How, how can urban governance be integrated for effective marine spatial planning it's about oceans uh, as more ah, attention marine, has uh, been given to land use planning for decades well the integration of land and sea is absolutely fundamental for the majority of the large cities in the world if we realize uh, the number of cities that are located on seaboard for obvious reasons of resource availability in terms of transport integration now globalization then it should be clear that we have a need for an integrated land sea approach um one example of this from the way in the back, way past that I knew about, which is interesting to think about, was the whole policy of from ridge to reef, which was practiced in Jamaica over 25 years ago, um, whereby um, anything that was happening downstream was caused by things happening upstream. And um, things that happened downstream then increased the probability of hazards from the sea inwards and consequently affecting urban areas in terms of wave action or uh, other things. It, what I can say here is that we need risk and exposure to hazard to be fully integrated into territorial planning and uh, urban development schemes. If we could reduce exposure to disaster related hazards, we would have no need for, although we would have need for, what is reduction of vulnerability, et cetera. If we could keep exposure limited, we would have solved a good part of the problem of disaster risk. Of course, that's not possible. And so territorial planning, urban planning has to be integrated with things such as building codes, building structure, limitations, et cetera. No? I'm not sure I answered the question, but anyway, I yeah. said something. <laughs> but there is, uh, before moving again to Dr. Anna, we have another question for you, Professor Allen. Is uh, It was in the chat. How we can use these tools uh, about disaster risk reduction and climate change adoption as the vital tools for decentralization sustainable development? Well, I think at the end of my talk, I said the major instrument strategies tools for disaster risk reduction are those that have been proposed to promote efficient and efficacious development sustainable development in general 
Um, there is a tendency to think that disaster risk reduction has its own in series of instruments. And that is most surely true when it comes to corrective management, because you only build a dike to protect against flooding because there is flooding. Although you could use the dike for other social purposes, like cycling on top of it or whatever, which has been done in many places. But when it comes to prospective management, we really aren't talking about disaster risk reduction. What we're talking about is guaranteeing sustainability of development. And that means um, um, putting in land use planning principles that take into consideration hazards. Many don't. Many propose it and don't do it. You know, in Colombia, a case I know well, it is by law local municipalities governments have to build in risk into their local development planning and spatial planning schemes but only 200 of 1080 actually do it why don't they do it because they don't have the capacity they don't have the resources they don't have the knowledge we don't have the um, um, um the skills that allows to do it and there are other more pressing problems apparently to be solved here we should realize that disaster risk is not a problem on its own. It is a problem for all other problems. And this is the problem of the holistic approach to planning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, you have a participant from Jamaica, Miss Sabrina, who would love to speak with you, Professor Allen. So maybe it is uh, in the chat. I put my data in the chat for anybody who would like to get in touch. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Anna? We have another question for you. Uh, this is the question. I noticed in developing countries implementing decentralization at the municipal local level, there is the high risk of political dynasty that increases the risk of prolonged corruption practices. Any thought what the best way that this uh, may be avoided, if not minimized in implementing decentralization system? Thank you. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the billion dollar question if we had the answer of how to address <laughs> address corruption and avoid political dynasties. So I will say that I try to get uh, into this issue a little bit in the guidance note, um, specifically in the context of Latin America that experienced um, big decentralization forms in the 80s, 90s and early 2000s. And I, I use the case of Colombia to explain that a little bit. So I will just say a little bit what Colombia did and, and hopefully that can illustrate this, uh, what can be done, although it's by no means prescriptive or, or it fits all countries. And so they figured that the issue with corruption at the local level might be due to the um, the revenues coming from the central level, but the expenditure being decided at the local level, right? So that and it was easy for local government leaders to hand out goodies to the local population because the resources from that came from, from, from the central government. And so they have recently moved a little bit uh, more towards increasing fiscal autonomy. And that seems very counterintuitive in that context where you have corruption and then you even increase autonomy more. But it, in, in the sense that um, the cost of corruption is localized then, right? So the local population bears the cost of corrupt, uh, corrupt practices. And the idea is that um, hopefully as a reaction, there will be more accountability as the local population is more concerned about how their taxes are spent and that you have a, a hopefully a closer tie at the local and regional level and um, ideally kind of increase accountability, transparency and, and make democracy at the local level work. That's not guaranteed to always work. This is, however, how, how the Colombian government reacted um, to that issue and how they um sort of the root cause where they perceive corruption to be coming from thank you thank you very much professor uh, anna the last question is uh, for uh, professor astrid please are you still with us yes i'm here yes. so the question is how do uh, political economy dynamics including key stakeholders influence reform processes for local revenue generation through decentralization and the enhanced tax authority and what are the successful cases and the drivers of such reforms in developing countries we need another workshop 
That's a huge question. Um, but let me let me just quickly, because I don't want to take up too much time, say, you know, political economy is very key to reform processes and can um, enhance or derail in for reform process. And therefore, if you do engage in a reform process, as I was trying to say, stakeholder um, analysis, stakeholder communication is key. That being said, I think, you know, there are a lot of reforms where political economy may play a role, but not as big a role. And these are administrative reforms. So reforms that can be done, let's say, at a local level of government without any need for approval from a higher level of government. And a lot of um, a lot of revenue can be uh, generated just through administrative reform. So making systems more efficient, uh, being able to digitize things. And so I would always encourage, um, particularly when you're starting reform process, to start with the, the low hanging fruit with the quick wins. Don't, don't start with taking on the sort of big political um, pieces because they can be long and they can be derailed, but there is still things that can be done in, in the meantime. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Astrid, for this clarification. I am very sorry, but uh, I would love to uh, give the floor to other uh, participants from the audience, but uh, we need uh, to uh, come to the end of our workshop. So allow me, uh, honorable uh, organizers, participants, guest speakers, just to uh, highlight some key points I gathered from the uh, all the presentations. The first one is the concepts matters. So we need really to uh, honor all this uh, concept we have uh, in this workshop, like subsidiarity, like uh, fiscal decentralization, multi-level governance, and so on. The national context matter. We cannot, uh, uh, in decentralization and subsidiarity, just copy and uh, past. Uh, there is a common challenge in uh, African uh, context with specific other challenge, uh, crucial need for coordination, coherence and cooperation between the different level of uh, governance, uh, huge and important weaknesses in capacities, resource mobilization, funding, and clear responsibilities between the different levels of, uh, uh, of uh, governance. And uh, we need a holistic systematic and strategic approach to uh, implement decentralization based on subsidiarity. So thank you very much for uh, your time, for your participation. And uh, thank you again for the, the uh, distinguished speakers, experts, and all of you for uh, participating in this uh, workshop. And I wish you the best uh, to all of you in this uh, holy uh, month of uh, Ramadan and beyond. And I give the floor uh, back to uh, Anna if uh, she wants to make any announcement. Thank you for inviting me and giving me this such honor. Thank you. Thank you, Najat, for your wonderful moderation. We are now at the end of the workshop. We apologize for the delay of the workshop the extension. Now, please, gratefully, you can um, use some time to complete the post-event survey. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Bye. Asalaamu.